Take your Bible this morning, please turn to 2 Peter chapter number 1, please. 2 Peter chapter number 1, and let me just say, uh, if you are a guest here today, um, I'm glad you're here. I'm thankful that you chose to be with us today, and I trust as we look into the Word of God that uh, you will receive a blessing as the Lord speaks to our hearts through the scriptures. Second Peter chapter number one, there's also in your bulletin a, a little insert that is there for you. I encourage you to use that and follow along in this particular message today. We're just going to read maybe four verses or so, and then I would ask if you would just uh, pray with me and ask God to speak to our hearts through the word of God this morning, Second Peter, chapter number one, and let's let's start reading in verse number twelve. We'll read through verse number fifteen, and then we'll have a word of prayer together. Notice, if you would, uh, verse number twelve. The Bible says, "Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established." in the present truth, yea, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Now look up here for just a minute before we continue reading what Peter's saying here. He's saying, he's speaking of that tabernacle as his flesh and he's saying that I know that my time is short He's saying that, that the Lord has revealed to me, as you'll see in the ensuing verses, that uh, this is my, uh, my last hurrah, if you will. And he says, there's something I want to do prior to my departure. And he brings it up specifically in verse number 13. He says that I want to stir you up in verse 13. He says at the end of verse 14, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able after my decease to have these things always in, say the last word with me. Let's have a word of prayer together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word that you preserved for us without error. Thank you for the local church. Thank you for the Holy Spirit of God which lives and dwells in us. And I pray today that we would be attentive and sensitive to the Spirit of God as no doubt wants to speak to each and every heart. I pray if there's somebody that walked through these doors today that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, they don't know what it means to have their sins forgiven. I pray today would be the day they put their faith, not in religion, but in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as their only hope for heaven. And we'll thank you for it. And we'll give you the glory. For it's in Christ's name we pray and amen. Uh, you'll notice in your notes the title of this particular message. And it's posed as a question. And it's a question that I would like if each one of us would ask ourselves, this includes myself, am I stirred up? Am I stirred up? In my life, there's been many things that I've been stirred about. Some have been fun things, and others have been serious things. Uh, I have no problem admitting this morning, I get stirred up. I get fired up about uh, watching a ball game, playing a ball game. I, I enjoy football. There's nothing wrong with, with being passionate about something. But God forbid I would ever be more passionate about a ball game than I would about the things of Christ. Competitions, things of that nature. Then there's things more serious that stir my soul. Maybe the direction of our country, the spiritual well-being of our churches. So as we consider this thought this morning, I want all of us just to kind of take inventory, do the best you can, ask yourself the question, what is it that stirs me? What is it that I'm passionate about? What stirs my soul? 
I want to remind you this morning that if you're saved, you have something living inside of you. Matter of fact, may I say the most powerful thing in the universe, and that happens to be the spirit of the living God. More powerful than anything. If you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Peter's saying, if you look at verse number 13, he's sharing his desire. His desire is to help them not forget what they have. Would you jump over to verse number nine in our text? Notice what he says in verse nine. He says, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Notice what he says, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his sins. Let me encourage you this morning. Don't ever forget, if you're saved, what you've been saved from. Don't ever forget it. He says in verse 12, matter of fact, if you look at verse 12, he says, I'm not even gonna be negligent. He says, I'm not gonna be derelict in my duty. And that is to remind you of what you have in Christ. And he's saying, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I'm gonna do the best I can to stir you up. And to remember, he uses the word remember and remember and forgotten multiple times in this passage. My desire today is to do the best I can to admonish you to make sure that you never forget what it means to be called a child of the living God. Don't ever lose sight of it. Now I have this morning uh, a little bit of maybe a base, a base analogy, uh, maybe a very elementary analogy, but I think that uh, if you'll pay attention, it will convey if you'll listen attentively. So up here I've got uh, something that uh, is, got something on the bottom that is going to represent the Holy Spirit. This here is going to represent a Christian. This is going to represent the Holy Spirit. And over here I have an empty one. And uh, just for an illustration that I want to share with you this morning, I'm going to take and I'm going to put in uh, 2% milk. <laughs> I asked the early service, how, how many of you are 2 percenters? Okay, some of you, my soul. I mean, where's the whole milk, right? Uh, I opened my fridge the other day and I think I saw skim milk. I mean, that's like white water. Hey, Brother Rich, you like skim milk? Oh, my soul. Skim milk. 2%. Anyway, it'll do for the illustration. It's good, you know, put it with a bunch of sugared cereal. It'll be all right. And throw in some heavy cream and you'll be fine. So just, just you know, uh, bear with me in my folly. This is going to represent the same thing over here, but... What I want to do with this one is I want to put in this the greatest thing in the universe outside of the spirit of the living God, and that is Hershey's syrup, right? Can I get an amen? So I almost took the cap off. I can't do that. I, you know, this, I mean, that's how you're supposed to do it. People are watching, so I'm going to put the cap back on here. And... So we'll do what you're supposed to do, and you're supposed to put a little of this in here. A little. No, there's no win. We haven't even got it started, sister. We're going, no. Moms are like, no, no, no. Come on. So it's, it's kind of, that's not, that, there we go. That's, that'll do for the illustration. So, now, what you have here, just for this analogy, you have what's going to re represent, this is going to re represent us, and this is going to represent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit resides in everybody that is saved. Amen? Yes. You have the Holy Spirit. Matter of fact, it's e Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. The Bible says that he has given us the earnest of the Spirit. That is the down payment. When you go to buy a house, uh, you put uh, earnest money down. And, and the Holy Spirit is the down payment, if you will, because we know the Lord's going to come back and he's going to take his purchased possession, which is us. Amen. But the problem with Christianity, if we're not careful, 
what can happen to us is we can allow the Holy Spirit to settle. See, this really is chocolate milk, but if you drank it, it would taste like water. And this here is the same thing over here. The difference is, how would I get this to taste good? Help me out, church. Stir it up. What does Peter say? He says, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I'm going to do the best I can. He says, to stir you up by way of remembrance. So we'll stir this up. How many of you guys want to drink this? Amen. <laughs> now, doesn't that look good? It's getting about lunchtime here. So, so anyway. Now, I'll refer back to this in a minute. But now it looks obviously much different than this one. But it has the same contents. So this morning... Let's just take a couple minutes and focus on a few thoughts that the Lord laid on my heart. I don't want to be condescending. I'm not going to try to be caustic, but I do want to challenge you to ask yourself the question, am I stirred up about these things or have I let them settle? Notice in your notes, if you would, the first thought is this, are you stirred up about your salvation? Psalm 40, look at verse number two. The Bible says he brought me up also out of an horrible pit and out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. Now here's the thing about that verse. Some of you be, might be like, well, I know that verse or I've heard that passage or I know before. Hey, I hope that never gets, I hope that never gets old to you. Because if, you if you're saved, listen carefully, he reached down in a horrible pit and in the miry clay, and he reached down, and he pulled you up out of that pit, amen. He pulled you up out of the miry clay, and he set your feet on a rock. Can I say that rock is Christ? Yep. He set your feet upon a rock. I hope, that you, I hope that stirs your soul. I hope you never get over your salvation that it still stirs you up. You're still thankful and you don't allow it to settle down and become dormant and where it's kind of like you've gotten over your salvation. To me, if there's anybody that should be walking in victory, it is the child of the living God. He didn't just come to give you life, Brother Jones, did he? He came to give you abundant life. You know, Je Jesus didn't just... Jesus paid it all. No, he paid it all, everything. You're saved. Your sins are forgiven. Praise God. They're as far as the east is from the west. They're, they're in the deepest part of the sea. And, and, you, and, and you can put up a sign, no fishing. Amen. They're forgotten. What a blessing. When Christ saved you. He came to give you not just life, but abundant life. I'm of the opinion that there are three simple reasons why some professing Christians aren't stirred about their salvation. Number one, it's not that they're backslidden. The potential is maybe they never really slid forward. You say, well, who knows that? Only God does. I'm not going to stand up and say, I know who's saved and who's not. But I've asked enough people, are you saved? And I've heard the response, well, yeah, you know, my mom was a Christian, or I was raised in church, or I was baptized, or I've always believed in God, or my grandma was a preacher. You name it, I've heard it all. But none of those things save you. So it's hard to get stirred up about your salvation if you've never fully been regenerated. See, there's a verse in the Bible in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says this, examine yourselves. By the way, if you're gonna if you're gonna jump out of an airplane, don't you think it's good to check the chute twice? Is that good? You, you probably would. Wouldn't you check it more than once? When you're dealing with eternity, that's why Paul says in his epistles to the church at Corinth and to us today, he's saying, examine yourselves of whether you be in the faith, except you be a what? A reprobate. And what is a reprobate? A reprobate is an unbeliever. So examine yourself. So some people, maybe they've never slid forward. Another thing is that people might not be stirred about their salvation because they don't fully understand the magnitude of what it means to be saved. 
I mean fully, and that could be because they're brand new Christians and they haven't fully understood truly that when you get saved, you literally have been crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, risen with Christ, ascended with Christ, seated with Christ. Ephesians 5 says you're bone and bone, flesh of his flesh, sealed to the day of redemption. You couldn't lose your salvation if you tried, and you could if you would, amen. And so would I. Or the most common they've gotten over their salvation. There was a time when they were excited about the things of God. But what has happened is the Holy Spirit of God is down here. You know that's why Paul says later, Paul says, stir up the gift of God which is in thee. Sometimes, and we all need it, sometimes you just need to be stirred up. And there's a way to do that and we'll talk about it in a minute. But this right here represents some Christians and, but, and guess what? Before you stone me, I'm not above this. This can be me. This can be me. Minus the 2%. <laughs> this is why Peter said, hey, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, as long as I'm alive, as long as I can breathe, he says, I want to do the best I can to, to stir you up he says, by way of remembrance, by looking back, uh, Moses told the children of Israel in Exodus 13, verse 3, he said, remember this day when God brought you out of Egypt, out of bondage by a mighty hand, by a strong hand, he brought you out. Don't forget it. Hey, can I say, church, don't ever forget that Jesus saved you if you're saved. Don't ever, not only don't forget it, don't ever get over it. Stay stern about it. There should never be a day. I know I say this all the time, but I'm gonna say it again. There should never be a day that you don't prostrate before your creator and you get down on your knees and you say, God, thank you for saving me. Every day, you ought to thank him for saving you. Don't ever get over your salvation. Peter said, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I wanna stir you up by putting you in remembrance. There's a verse I've been meditating on for the last couple weeks. It's in Psalm 136, and verse number 23 says this, who rem it's very simple, who remembered us in our low estate, for his mercy endureth forever. You know what uh, God did for you if he saved you? He remembered you in your low estate. Okay, we're nothing. We are nothing. If a man thinks himself to be something, and he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We are nothing, he's everything. And if you really want to be stirred, remember what you were saved from. The penalty of your sin, which, which by the way, I know it's not popular, can, can I say this for the record, there is a heaven and there is a hell. We, we go to Romans 10, 13, and rightfully so. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. But there's another whosoever found in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 and verse 15 that says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So you ought to make sure that your name is in the book of life. Remember where you came from. So truly, how is it with you today? Are you still stirred about your salvation? Or is it kind of begin to kind of dissipate and settle deep down in your soul? Well, the answer to that is just, you just got to, and by the way, I have to do it all the time. <laughs> I'm constantly, you say, well, you're in the ministry, it must be easy. No, not at all. Stir it up. Because that's what you need to do. Otherwise, you just kind of be more of a nominal Christian and you'll, you won't walk in victory. Secondly, notice if you would, are you stirred up about sin? Are you stirred up about sin? Look at Psalm 97, verse 10. The Bible says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. Would you say that with me? Ye that love the Lord hate evil. I hope Open Door Baptist Church is full of people that are stirred in their soul about sin. 
Sin in the, oh, I can't believe the direction of the country. I can't believe where we're going. Yes, the moral depravity, the ethics and the values and all that that are dissipating. We know that. And we ought to be stirred. It ought to bother us. We ought to abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. We ought to abhor evil. But we also ought to be stirred about our own sin. It ought to bother us to the point of repentance where we get it right. Ye that love God hate evil. The Bible makes that crystal clear. Now, if I were to ask you the question, do you hate evil? Well, no doubt everybody would say, well, yes, I hate evil, and rightfully so. Yet, as with many things, God's standards sometimes are different than what we have made as standards. Let me give you an example. The Bible says in Psalm 101 and verse number three, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. So without, okay, it's legalism and it's very prudish and old fashioned. And no, 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 no. Does the Bible say, I will set no wicked thing before thine eyes? The light of the body is the eye. The eye is the gateway to the soul. And what you and I see with our eyes affects our hearts and our minds and our spirits and everything about us. So God's given us this great admonition and reminder, don't set anything wicked before your eyes. Because why? Because you hate evil. You ought to be stirred about sin to the point where you say, I'm not going to watch that or do that or listen to that. Why is it that Christians in droves pay to watch ungodly and perverse wickedness is mind-boggling to me. They're doing exactly what the Bible says not to do, setting wicked things before their eyes. And the Bible says if you love God, you'll hate evil. I'd say to parents, to the, with all due respect, and I'm preaching to myself, don't give in on the battle. Not legalism. Well, fundamentalism destroyed many kids. I'm not even gonna go down that road. I think there's many ills that have happened through the years in Christendom in general. But we all have a responsibility before a holy God. And we still have a Bible and God's word has not changed. Forever thy word is settled in heaven. I'd say to parents, don't give in. It's not their phone. Don't even go down that road. There's no privacy like that. You're the parent, they're the child. The solution about getting stirred up it's just every once in a while to ask yourself the question, am I allowing anything in my life in along these lines that would not be pleasing to God? See, the devil will look for any little kink in the armor, any little window, any little crack he can get in there because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And God says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever it is that you sow, you shall reap. You know what you ought to do? You ought to get stirred up about your salvation. You also ought to get stirred up about sin. As you're watching what's going on around you, ask yourself the question, does it stir you to watch our country go to hell in a handbasket? Does it fire you up to see the moral decay in our society? Are you bothered to watch our government get involved in curriculum that teaches kids things that are diametrically opposed to the Bible? See, it's not about the churches should get together and talk about, well, I wonder, you know, because society's changing and things are changing. And by the way, by the way, I'm not against anybody. I know what God says. I have a heart and a compassion for everybody to get saved. But that doesn't mean that we wince or just glance at sin and say, well, this is now acceptable. We ought to stand for what is right. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Parents, we need not to give in. There's too much at stake. The question is simple. Are you stirred about sin? Are you stirred enough to do something about it? I know I've said this before and I'll say it again. Part of what happens, and we're, nobody's above it. I like to chill out and watch a show sometime. That's what, I'll do a vid angel or a clear play. You can write those down. There's both things. So you can watch a movie and not have to be cussed at or have the Lord's name taken through the dirt, and it just takes it out. And I'll pay the money to do it. 
So I don't, you know, so I can watch it. But I will tell you, no matter even that, you have to be careful. Because when you're watching a program, do you know why they call it a program? Because they're programming you. Why do you think Christianity, the numbers are escalating when people are now saying, well, this is acceptable and this is acceptable and I think this is acceptable and I don't have a Facebook uh, or, or those things, but I know that people have come to me and said, I can't believe I'm a Christian and I stood up for this one thing and I was lambasted by Christians for standing with things the Bible says. Well, what has happened? Christians have been programmed and they're changing their views at the end of the message, I'll give you a few things that will help you to get stirred in these areas. Thirdly, would you notice, are you stirred up about Sunday? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day is approaching. What I mean by this is, is church something you do? Is it just something you check off the list? Or is it a highlight of the week? When, when the choir sings, Jesus saves, does it stir your soul? Does it do something for you? Does it draw you to the Lord? When the Bible's preached, are you like the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24 when they say, did not our hearts burn as you spoke to us the word of God? Sundays. Or do you come to church and wonder if the preacher's gonna be done? How long is he gonna go? Critique the message. And by the way, there's a lot to critique. Each message, we should simply ask, what does God want us to hear? Do you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know why the Lord laid this message on my heart other than I had it done two weeks ago and I, and I kept thinking when I should preach it and he wouldn't give me peace about it till today. May I say, if we're going to be a testimony to those who come into our assemblies looking for answers, I hope to God that they see a church that is stirred about the things of God. Stirred. I mean, stirred up. If a lost person comes into a local assembly and they see something dead, is that going to do something for them? I was in Germany some two years ago, and I'll never forget, just handing out tracts, inviting people to church, and we were having a revival meeting, and, and I was always drawn to the young people, and I would talk to them, and I remember one particular individual by the name of Fabian, and I remember talking to Fabian and asking him if he was saved, and he was not. Super nice kid. My heart went out to him. He says, not saved. I said, do you go to church? He said, I don't go, I don't go to church. He says, look around you. And it was my first time in Germany and I'm looking around and you know what I saw all around me? Churches everywhere, everywhere. He says they're dead, completely dead. When a lost person walks into a local assembly, they don't need some dry, liturgical, boring, dead service. They need to see Christians with the glory of the Lord on their face, singing praises to his name, attentively listening to the word of God so he can speak to them. And guess what? That's a testimony to those that walk in our doors. David said in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go in to the house of the Lord. I want you to notice in that verse, it's interesting, and look at your notes, Hebrews 10, 25. He says, so much the more as you see the day approaching. You are looking at a preacher that believes Jesus Christ is coming back soon. He's coming back soon, and uh, we need to make sure that as the day is approaching, that we're actually still stirred up about the things of God. Still stirred up. You know, when, when, when Christians see you, when, when, excuse me, when the lost people see you, when you go to work tomorrow, do you know when they see you or you, your neighbors or your relatives or your coworkers or you name it, did you know the Bible says that ye are the epistles of Christ, known and read of all men? They're reading you, they're reading me. They're reading you. What are they reading? It's a fair question to ask. They never, may, never walk through the doors of a church, but they're reading you. You are the epistles of Christ, known and read of all men. 
You're looking at a preacher who loves, and I mean loves, the local New Testament church. And if Pastor Blue didn't come here 50 years ago and start this local assembly because God told him to, I would not be saved. And I would not be here. I love the church. Jesus Christ saved my soul, but the local church saved my life. Don't forsake it. It's a clear command. The last thing we need to be doing in the last days is forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And, and he says, as the manner of some is. And that's happening today. Many Christians are just laying out. Did, did you know this? I'm for vacations a thousand percent. I think you ought to take your families on vacation. I think you ought to find a church when you go on vacation, but I think you ought to take your family on vacation. Multiple times, do what you can, get away. But God forbid that we don't make the local church a priority. It's not a trivial thing. Christ died for the church. We ought to get stirred up about Sundays. Sunday night at Open Door is my favorite service. It's my favorite service. It's when I let my hair down, all that's left. (laughs) If you had one 30-minute service per week, you won't last to the buttermelts. God chose the foolishness of preaching. You won't make it. It's hard to grow. My people work, I understand that. I have grace with that. God does. You know one of my favorite verses in the Bible? Psalm 92, look at this verse. Psalm 92, verse 13, notice. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. By the way, I'm not a rocket scientist, Floyd, but I know this. I know this. If I just take that verse for face value, and if I'm planted in the house of the Lord, Brother Gary, I'm going to flourish. I'm going to flourish. And guess what? So will you. Matter of fact, if you look at the next verse, I don't know if we have verse 14, but the next verse, notice what it says. I don't have the next verse in my notes. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Hey, I'd say to the folks that are up in years, finish, finish well, finish clean, finish with joy the best that you can. When you're planted, you flourish. By exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So in telling us that, the return of the Lord approaches, we need to make sure that we're assembling more and more. I've heard all the excuses. Well, God's in the mountain and God's at the beach. Christ didn't die for the mountains or the beach. Amen. He didn't die. I heard a story about a pastor. This pastor, he, uh, he went to a, a home of a church member who had just been laying out and laying out and laying out and wasn't coming to church. So he's at the, one of his church members' house and he said, what are you doing? He says, I'm just sitting by the fire. Oh, okay. I haven't seen you at church for a while. You stopped coming to church. He says, well, you know, pastor, to be honest with you, you know, God meets with me here. I don't really need to go to church because God is everywhere. Pastor, just pause for a minute. He reached over to that fire and he grabbed some, he grabbed some tongs and he took one of those hot coals and he pulled that hot coal away from the other coals And he set it there on the little cement thing next to the fire. And he set it there, and they both just looked at it. And he watched that coal just turn gray as it died. Pastor didn't say anything at all. He looked at the the church member, and the church member finally looked at him. He goes, I'll be at church on Sunday. He got the point. Do you know we can, we can allow, just like those of the Roman persuasion, to become very liturgical and ritualistic where we come to church, we sing the songs, we sit down, we shake hands. Nothing changes. When you come to church, you ought to beg God to speak to your heart. You ought to pray before you go, break up the fallow ground. Help me to receive the engrafted word. Speak to me, Lord. 
Bless our preacher. Fill him with the Holy Ghost. Save souls today. It'll do something for you if you just spend a few minutes in prayer before you come through the doors because we're inundated with things in the world. You have to prepare yourself. What'll happen if we're not careful is we'll be just like this and our, the Holy Spirit will settle in us and we'll just kind of, yeah, well, you know, as a church Sunday, the preacher seemed a little bit more fired up. He was a little bit, uh, I don't know what he was all worked up about anyway and we'll lose sight of what God wants to do in your life. I'll say this again. The last thing the world needs in this day and age is another nominal church and another nominal Christian. May Open Door Baptist Church be a church full of people that are stirred up about the things of God, stirred up about their salvation, stirred up about sin, stirred up about Sundays, and then lastly, stirred up about souls. Would you look at Matthew chapter 9? We see our Savior. Verse 36, speaking of Jesus, he saw the multitude, he was moved with what? Compassion. He saw him fainting, scattered abroad as sheep with no shepherd. You know what Jesus was? He was moved with compassion. He came to seek and to save that which was So what I, what I want to do today as we close this message is one more reminder. Let's just make sure, because no man lives unto himself, that we do the best we can. And by the way, I'll just say this. This is the thing I have to stir myself up the most about because it sure is easy for me to think of Jason Murphy. It sure is easy for me to not see other people as souls. It sure is easy, to, easy for me to get cold, indifferent, and apathetic towards those kinds of things. I know myself when I'm walking through the grocery store and I'm begging God that there's one of those uh, self-checkouts so I don't have to look anybody in the eye, amen? Don't look at me like that. And I just gotta constantly stir it, constantly stir it, there's a story in the Bible, and I'll close. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, you have Jesus in verse 1, comes into the city. Well, here he is. He enters in. He's going to a house. I'm paraphrasing for time. Comes in. Everybody starts coming in. Jesus is preaching. Then all of a sudden, it gets crowded. More and more people come, and more and more people come, and more and more people come. And next thing you know, it says that the press came and everybody was trying to get in and it was full. But there was somebody in Mark chapter number two who got fired up and got stirred up about souls. And it says, I want you to notice, they should have it behind me, when they, verse number three or four, and when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, notice what they did. They uncovered the roof where he was, where Jesus was, and they had broken it up and they let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay and Jesus saw their faith and he said unto the sick of the palsy, thy sons be forgiven thee. You say, well, Pastor Murphy, what happened? You had some people that got so stirred up about getting this lost person who's a picture of you and me to Jesus Christ that they couldn't get in. So they thought, what are we going to do? They didn't just say, well, we, that was full today. No, they took the roof off the place and they lowered him down and Jesus saw their faith and he saved the man. May we get so stirred in our souls that we have compassion on those around us. How do you do it? Watchman Nee made this statement. Never adopt an attitude of indifference. For if you do, you will suffer for it. The weight will grow heavier and heavier. How do I get stirred up? How do I stop from this? How do I stop? See, if I drink this, you know what this is going to taste like? It's going to taste like milk, right? It's going to taste like milk. This still represents a Christian saved with the Holy Spirit. 
But this Christian allowed the Holy Spirit just to come down here and they're no longer stirred. Things don't move them like they used to. I'm not above that and neither are you. We're dependent on God. We have to, as Peter said, we have to be stirred up by a way of remembrance. Remember what you were saved from. Remember how serious sin is and let it stir you to repentance. Remember how important Sundays in is in, in church. It's not a trivial thing. And then remember, you ought to be stirred up about souls. You ought to tell people Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh upon the Father but by me. You ought to let them know that neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. You ought to let them know that Jesus said, except the man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. You ought to tell them. Or, it'll just go settle down like this. And by the way, God won't force himself on you. You have to do it yourself. Now, he's given you a church, he's given you a preacher, he's given you a Bible, he's given you the Holy Spirit. But because the world will suck everything out of you, the world, the flesh, the devil. Interesting verse in Galatians chapter number 5 and verse 16. The Bible says this, if you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The flesh warreth against the Spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These two are contrary one to the other. So you cannot do the things that you would. You ought to feed your soul on the word of God. Pastor Murphy, how can I get stirred up? Never forget where you came from. Stay in church. Stay in your Bible. See people as souls. And stay close to the fire. 